अहम बंटे ईसर ने न सह पंच शीलानी या जानी तुटियम पी अहम बंटे ईसर ने न सह पंच शीलानी या जानी तटियम पी अहम बंटे ईसर ने न सह पंच शीलानी या जानी तमोदस भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुधस नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समो तस भगवत अर्हत समो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदस नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदस नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदस ृतीयं समाधियामि 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 इमानि पंच सिखा पदानि सीलेन सुगतिं यन्ति सीलेन मोहक संपदा सीलेन निबुतिं यन्ति तस्मा सीलं सोदाय ए ंडरविंदरविंद The reclose Gotama, the son of the Sakians, went forth from a Sakian clan, has been wandering in the Kosalan country with a large sangha of bhikkhus, and has come to Nagaravinda. Now a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect, that Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, as Sutta forty one. Paragraph two, he re- reveals a ho- he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. 
paragraph two, the Brahmin householders of Sala heard the Riklus Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from a Sakyan clan, has been wandering in the Kosalan country with a large Sangha of bhikkhus and has come to Sala. Now, a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect that blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of the world, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares his wor world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end. With the right meaning of phrasing, he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. Then the Brahmin householders of Nagaravinda went to the Blessed One. Some paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. Some exchanged greetings with him. And when his courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One and sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the Blessed One's presence and sat down at one side. Some kept silence and sat down at one side. When they were seated, the Blessed One said to them, Householders, if wanderers of other sects ask you thus, Householders, what kind of recluses and Brahmins should not be honored, respected, revered, and venerated? You should answer them thus, those recluses and Brahmins who are not rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding forms cognizable by the eye, whose minds are not inwardly peaceful, and who conduct themselves now righteously, now unrighteously in body, speech, and mind. Such recluses and Brahmins should not be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Why is that? Because we ourselves are not rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding forms cognizable by the eye. Our minds are not inwardly peaceful, and we conduct ourselves now righteously, now unrighteously, un in body, speech, and mind. Now we do not see any higher righteous conduct on the part of those good recluses and Brahmins. They should not be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Uh, I have a question here, Bhante, though, um, because, um, I mean, I hear... For example, you say that we should uh, honor and respect and venerate uh, any kind of bhikkhus if, if they just they just virtuous and just keeping their precepts and etc. So, I mean, I I feel like this is a conflict. What the Buddha is saying that they should not not be. I don't know if that's an accurate representation of what I've said or not. Sure. But my understanding was that uh, we should venerate and respect. Well, you should venerate and respect, as the Buddha said, those who are free. But something to understand is that he's talking about the Buddha, and the Buddha himself would have um, assumed that people would respect the, the people following his teaching. You'll notice near the end of the sutta, he changes the wording. To, from, from those who are free of these things to free or practicing to be free. And so there's an acknowledgement of the difference between those two categories of people, but there's an acknowledgement of the existence of a third group, those who, who are not free but are practicing to be free. And those who have ordained as monks are uh, considered to be a part of that group in a sort of a special way because they've dedicated their lives to it, theoretically. But that being said, a monk is uh, not practicing well, there's really no reason to 
um, to, to esteem them. And there is a reason to pay formal respect because of the esteem we have for the station of being a monk and for the representation of the Sangha. As that person is that person is part of the Sangha, the Bhikkhu Sangha, which includes the Buddha, you're paying respect to them as a, as the station, as the, the community or the group, which includes the Buddha. So their, their, their robes represent the Buddha and represent the Arahants. Yes, I understand. I just realized that uh, it was about like any kind of Brahmins and recluses, right? It's and not uh, about the bhikkhus, uh, the Sangha of the Buddha. Yeah, he's what he's not saying is that he there, there's the idea that being a part of the Buddha Sasana is, is enough to some extent. I mean, it's not enough, but it's it, it there's some reach, there's some extension there. I guess what he's saying is that out of all the Brahmins and recluses, out of all the religions posed by Brahm, by recluses and Brahmins, um, it, it's really the Buddha's religion. Why? Because it involves the freedom from greed, anger, and delusion, which you won't see in other religions, is the claim. And so once you make that distinction, then it's just all respect for the Buddha and his teaching and for those who practice his teaching. And there is a, there is a formal respect for monastics, but you yeah, you know, as you point out, that's not what he's talking about. He's not making a distinction between monastics and monks. So representing the sangha here means that representing uh, a community or, or, or the monks who have freed themselves from uh, greed, uh, anger, and delusion, or those who are working towards freeing themselves. So you want to on a, a monk who may not be that virtuous as someone who represents the Sangha, so he represents those who are virtuous or those who were virtuous. Yeah, You're still on extent. a but also doesn't this isn't not what Bhante said made uh i mean it hit me a little bit because other religions i feel like they promote greed and you know it's just so different i mean the society promotes greed and the world around everyone everything promotes it so. I mean, it is a point that even in the Buddhist religion, the only the only object of reverence really is the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Arya Sangha. So you don't really have any, there's no requirement or expectation for people to revere someone just because they're wearing monk's robes. I think there's, this, uh, we've talked about this, there's just, there's a, expectation or a, a, a agreement there's a convention of formal respect for monastics for two reasons i mean for the nobility of the cause they've they've done something that's hard to do and many people are find themselves unable to do or unwilling to do but also out of respect for the symbol of the of it the, the reverence for the state of the monk Bande, can I ask a question uh, about the sentence? Uh, we conduct ourselves now righteously and now are righteously in body, mind, and speech. Um, this is not very clear to me because uh, um, I can say that in my experience, uh, sometimes I, I behave uh, unrighteously without uh, do it maybe on purpose. but. Uh, so till you don't arrive to the stage of Sotapanna, you will, in a w one way or another one, commit this erratically action, no? Well, even a, even a Sotapanna can perform. So, the, so the, sorry, this is my question. So, what the Buddha referred to, because then all most of them are in this. Well, why do they commit these? Why do they commit sometimes 
No, I'm asking. Is that because? I'm oh, sorry. I'm asking you why. Me? Why? Because um, sometimes uh, uh, with the, with the speech and mind uh, um, comes up some things that uh, I recognize it only after they have a reason that they are wrong. Oh, so why did they do something wrong sometimes? Oh, because there is what is described above. So that such a person therefore. So in this case, the Buddha talk about Haran. He's even talking about himself. It's it's more of a. I mean, I don't mean to try and uh, put words in the Buddha's mouth or something, but it's more of a. Or it it's kind of the way that we see the Buddha talk in in terms of. He's not making the distinction between people within his religion so much as he's making a distinction between religions and he's saying as far as leaders go you're paying respect to the buddha is most valuable he's, he's talking to people who are not buddhist he's, he's he's not really telling them to make a distinction between his followers i mean kind of but that's not the point the point is make the bold claim about what is important for revering someone and so it kind of means that again we shouldn't emphasize revering we revere the buddha and this is i mean it, it speaks to the idea of not being too concerned with guru guru worship or obsessing over individuals or teachers or that sort of as we look to the buddha as well i understand thank you very much Bhante. In the, in the second paragraph, you can clearly notice that the householders are coming to see the arahats. So it says now it is good to see such arahats. So the Buddha is giving mm. the standard of an arahat here. He's starting with the standard of an arahat, and then he's claiming for yeah, that. Who really does what makes someone worthy? Those recluses and brahmins who are not rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding sounds cognized cognizable by the ear regarding odors cognizable by the nose regarding flavors cognizable by the tongue regarding tangibles cognizable by the body regarding mind object cognizable by the mind those minds are not inwardly peaceful and who conduct themselves now righteously now unrighteously in body speech and mind should not be honored since we do not see any higher righteous conduct on the part of those good recluses and brahmins, they should not be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Being thus asked, householders, you should answer those wanderers of other sects in the foot. It's, an, it's a bit of an odd uh, phrasing that I'm not sure that that's how we would say even say it in English. But just to be clear, well, oh, sorry, where it says now on now, now righteously, now unrighteously. That's not actually what the Pali says. Literally, I mean, it's not, it's not misleading, but it's just an awkward. Um, what he says is they conduct themselves. And I'm not sure what the good translation would be, but let's say simply well and unwell. They conduct themselves sometimes i mean the meaning is sometimes sometimes well and sometimes unwell or um right rightly and wrongly it's maybe it's a very simple construct it's it's just a compound in fact rightly and wrongly is is the idea they conduct themselves both rightly and wrongly and of course the implication is that they don't always do the right way it's clear it's just clear to that's not really how we don't say now, rightfully, now it's, a, it's a very sort of holding. The Pali is quite simple. Verse 6. Ask you thus, householders, what kind of recluses and brahmins should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated? You should answer them thus. Those recluses and brahmins who are rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding forms, cognitive cognizable by the eye, whose minds are inwardly peaceful and who conduct themselves righteously in body, speech, and mind, 
such recluses and the Brahmin should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Why is that? Because we ourselves are not rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding forms cognizable by the I. Our minds are not inwardly peaceful, and we conduct ourselves now right, righteously, now unrighteously in body, speech, and mind. Since we see higher righteous conduct on the part of those re good recluses and the Brahmin, they should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Those recluses and Brahmins who are, who are rid of lust, hate, and delusion regarding sound, cognizable by the ear, regarding odor, cognizable by the nose, regarding flavor, cognizable by the tongue, regarding tangible, cognizable by the body, regarding mind object, cognizable by the mind, whose mind are inwardly peaceful and who conduct themselves righteously in body, speech, and mind should be honored. Since we see higher righteous conduct on the part of those good recluses and Brahmins, they should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Being thus asked, Householder, you should answer those wanderers of those sects in this way. Householders, if wanderers of other sects ask you thus, what are your reasons and what is your evidence regarding those venerable ones, whereby you say about them, surely these venerable ones are either rid of lust or are practicing for the removal of lust. They are rid, either rid of hate or are practicing for the re removal of hate. They are either rid of delusion or are practicing for the removal of delusion. Being asked thus, you should answer those wanderers of other sex thus. It is because those venerable ones resort to, rem resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest. For there are no forms recognizable by the eye. There are I there of a kind that they could look at and delight in. There are no sounds cognizable by the ear. They are of, there of a kind that they could listen to and delight in. There are no odors cognizable by the nose there of a kind that they could smell and delight in. There are no flavors cognizable by the tongue there of a kind that they could taste and delight in. There are no tangibles cognizable by the body there of a kind that they could touch and delight in. These are our reasons, friends. This is our evidence whereby we say about those venerable ones, surely these venerable ones are either rid of lust, hate, and delusion, or are practicing for their removal. Being thus asked, householders, you should answer those wanderers of other sects in this way. When this was said, the Brahmin householders of Nagaravinda said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gautama, Magnificent Master Gautama, Master Gautama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright but had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the darkness for those who with eyesight to see forms. We go to Master Gautama for refuge and to, to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gautama accept us as lay followers who have gone to him for refuge for life. I was wondering, uh, like, how would anyone recognize another one that uh, who is actually rid of lust and things like that if they have these uh, defilements themselves? Is that possible? This isn't actually enough. This isn't actually enough to recognize. You, of course, can't recognize someone just because they resort to jungle. But he's making a point to people who are outside the religion. Uh, people who act in such a way or direct themselves or conduct themselves in such a way that is 
directed against or directed away from sensuality, those those, are those who are uh, seeking out or moving towards or dwelling in monks sensuality, it's much more likely that they're attracted to sensuality. Anyone who goes off into the jungle, it's hard to argue that they are, or not the jungle, into the forest, into the wilderness. It's hard to argue that they are seeking out sensuality by doing so. And uh, the commentary makes a point here. It says, what, is there no sensuality in, in the jungle? Of course there is. But um, there's not objects of sexual attraction, uh, etc. Et it says, I mean, women and women, etc. it says. But it's not just women and women for men, of course, women for heterosexual men. Obviously, it's not just women, except that it would have been mostly men or it would have been men. They go off into the jungle, it's because... Um, in this, I mean, we are in modern times, right? The 2,600 uh, years away from this situation, like uh, we can't exactly go into the forest, uh, in my opinion. So what would be the modern uh, version of this seclusion, Bante? Both for bhikkhus and for lay people. Last time I checked, there still were forests. We haven't cut them all down, have we? <laughs> oh, we are yeah, close, we I think. <laughs> we still have monks going off to forests to meditate. You do? You, in, uh, yeah. Sri Lanka, right? We have, yeah, monasteries. Uh, in forest areas. Well, I don't live in a forested area at the moment, but I certainly encourage it. So, uh, how would how would the uh, sorry how would the bhikkhu live in the forest? Like, would they have a like a tent or something with shelter? Can, this uh, winter time. A hut. Oh. And okay. can also, in, in, in places like Sri Lanka, you can just live under a tree. In Thailand, I lived under a tree in, in a tent and that sort of thing. There's actually, in Thailand, they use umbrellas. They have these big, well, fairly big umbrellas that you can, you can at least sit under. You could also lie under um, not during the rainy season. And so it's an umbrella that has a, a, a mosquito net around it. So you'd hang the umbrella from the tree and you take the handle off, so it's just the top of the umbrella, it unscrews the handle, you hang a net around it, they go on alms. So you, you don't live in deep jungle, that is a good point, because people might think that go deep into the jungle miles and miles away, and that's not proper either. There's a discussion about the proper distance, and there is a proper distance. Can I ask, uh, how is the training? How do you train uh, yourself without, because, well, as a live person, you have a lot of distraction. You get rid of all of it. Um, how do you train without lying down? Are you suggesting that it's better to have distractions in order for... No, 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 no. I was bad. Um, my question is because I don't imagine it to have the training the whole day. I mean, it was going to be quite overwhelming in my mind because of it. So I just, I was asking if, they, I mean, you get distracted by your teacher or you you are independent meditation practice and you practice this one. Well, it's so as it's, we do it here at our center, you, you know how we run courses here. So yeah, you, you do the same, surely. Because I have done only the atom courses, so I'm not sure. Mm. Well, you can do, whatever. it's not a, it's not a, factory or a, a computer so you for example if you go to the monastery under sensitive teacher you should um, train based on what well i like, can tell you what you should do specific situations whether you should do so let's this say is that basically the, a forest training there's no need for uh, there's obviously the glaring thing about the suttas there's obviously no need to go to the forest whatsoever and there's no if you go to the forest that's going to be enough it's just he's saying something to people who aren't buddhists 
pointing out to them that look at all these Brahmins and recluses chasing after sensuality. It's pretty obvious that they've got this. Whereas uh, you look at these other recluses, they're shying away from them, they're inclining towards the forest. That's a good sign. Thank you, Bhakti. Uh, make too much. You don't want to make too much of going to the forest. Some people will not. For example, they won't come here because it's not the forest, or I mean, we have a bit of a forest, you could call this, but it's in the city. It's, we have an acre with some trees on it. Um, there's no there's no reason why this can't be just as valuable, but people say, no, no, it's not in the forest. The Buddha said the forest is necessary, and they make too much out of the forest. It's not something uh, we should throw away or discard. It's, it's quite valuable. It's not, it's not, of high, high value. It's just a sort of a basic value thing. And again, he's not really talking. He's, he's saying, pointing, pointing out that clearly there's a distinction. Seek out sensuality and those who don't. If we had a forested area here, and where we would have done that. You wouldn't immediately go to the forest, right? You, that's, it's gradual, you know, because uh, Claudia mentioned it would be too much. Yes, of course, we have to get used to it slowly. I don't know if it's a good idea to start the training by immediately. Think about the forest. It's more challenging about what are you going to do in the forest. You're just going to go live in the forest. You've got nothing to distract you, nothing to do. But the same goes if you stay at home. Yeah, but practicing all day. The forest can be especially scary because it's foreign and it's like snakes and monsters. There's a lot of a spooky imagination and the sounds of the forest. I think there are recommendations when you go to the forest not to uh, where animal, dangerous animal come to drink or not to say, stay near a river and not to stay where women come to pick uh, firewood so not to stay too far from the village. You go to a forest think? monastery and you practice meditation, it's, it's pretty the forest part of it is pretty trivial. You won't really notice much difference between the... What you'll notice is how much smoother it is living in the forest. Once you get into them, it's um, quite peaceful, harmonious with your practice. So that's the benefit. There is valuable, but it's much more of a beginner sort of thing. And it's not without benefits to be challenged uh, by having something similar so so practicing in in the meditation center in the town or in the city there is there is some value in being challenged but what you could more say is that a person who spends time practicing mindfulness and does purify their mind will incline away from 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 social social society and, and distraction and excitement and all of that so they'll be more inclined to live in, in or even forested area. I mean, I, I was just thinking that, uh, why is it that so important where we are? I mean, for me, um, spiritual life is like every single moment. It's not like when only when I'm on retreat or only when I do formal practice or etc. It's every moment, really. So basically, it's not, it's not uh, like, oh, I'm in the forest and we can turn on our spiritual practice. And then if I leave the forest, then I'm turning it off or something going to continue, right? He's implying that people are inclined to the forest, or inclined places that are devoid of, sen of sensual pleasures and stay mm -hmm. free themselves from the desire for those things. That's why you live the lay life. Don't stay in the lay life once you the less uh, craving you have. Oh, that's a good reason. That's a, but it's also a bit of a misleading idea that living the lay life frees you from craving. It doesn't free you from craving. It puts you in a position like going to the forest as where you'll be less uh, caught up, less assault, less of an assault, assault on the senses. You'll be secluded. The uh, 
monastic life has seclusion packed into it. And seclusion doesn't free you from craving, but it helps you free yourself from craving or provides you with better means to free yourself from craving. Still have to do the work. Somewhat similar to students who wants to study for an exam, they go to a quiet room and study instead of just going to some bare noisy, we go into the TV room where everybody's making noises. It's easier if you go to a quiet place and study compared to going to some where it is not uh, suitable to study. However, seclusion, first step to start the training. Is that right? First step is sealer. If seclusion means that being alone in your own around you, but not in the room, but in the house, for example, then seclusion is a part of the that. first steps. I think in the, um, in the Q&A, uh, Bhante also says some um, and seclusion is like a state of mind or part of your state of mind as well, not just uh, something that's physical. There's Haranya Gatawa, Rukkambula Gatawa, Shunyagara Gatawa, so three options. Haranya Gatawa is monastery, Shunyagara is empty place, empty room. Rukkambula is under a tree. So, Bhante, I noticed that. Um, usually, I mean, the teaching depends on who's listening, right? So basically this sutta only talks about who should be revered. So for lay people, I guess that's the only thing, uh, or it depends who's in the, who's in the crowd, right? Or this is just the only benefit that they can get, actually, just revering uh, holy pe people, holy persons, free from lust, no, greed. I think that's not a, you're, you're, you're missing, and this is important, don't miss the, the, the being actually taught here. It's couched in this language of respect, but what's he actually talking about? That's something much more important. That's easy to skip over because of how simple it is. What is he actually talking about? Well, I, I think, I mean, I still notice the, you know, the, no, sounds uh, cognizable by the ear, others cognizable by the nose, etc. And I form cognizable by the eye somewhere, I think it says. So the senses, I, I think that, uh, those are the traps, I, I guess. The what? And I also... Sorry? The what? The traps. The senses, right? Yes. So the, that and the three, three defilements and conduct, body, speech, and mind, three doors of conduct. That's what's really being taught here. And that's what's going to resonate with the audience. They're going to acknowledge the, the greed, anger, and delusion, the uh, hint at the direction in order to free themselves. And it's, it's part of this shift of perspective away from to actually experience. By pointing out the senses, you're describing reality, which helps people direct their minds to see reality. So these, these are the kinds of teachings because, yes, these are people who are not meditating. So these are the kind of teachings that are a way of introducing people to meditation. It's a good reminder when you're talking to people about Buddhism, don't get caught up in concepts and ideas and the theories and so on of actual awareness. Yes, I guess I put too much, uh, too much on uh, importance on the honor, respected, and revered and venerated part. Thank you for clarifying. Well, it's easy to miss the, the nuts and bolts of the nitty gritty of the sense. It's so simple and unexciting. 
ideas and theories and things like respect and so on are more nobody wants to talk about the six senses <laughs> why would you it's, it's kind of dull and um, there's a poly word I notice it's used to uh, seclusion but also discernment is there like a connection between them can you copy paste the word in the chat viveka Might they have a question? The paragraph six seems to suggest that there is absolutely no in order to identify whether someone has completely. Is it only from the senses that you don't know? Is there any way of identifying a person who may be either an arhant or very close to that? Is it not discernible only yes. to an external person's senses? Or is there any metric by which? What about physiological aspects such as breath? You need to hurry and stop breathing. <laughs> well, I... Okay, no. So, I mean, what I do understand is that mind and the breath are very closely related. Therefore, what happens in the mind can be somewhat of a identity seen through what happens to the breath. Which is why we practice anapanasati in the first place, in the mind to calmness. I heard uh, someone say that um, <clears throat> I don't know is it is it true or is it common in Sri Lanka or or India that uh, people like think that they can recognize enlightened beings by their voice that um, how they listen to their voice and apparently something like just so calm or something i don't know that they think yeah. that they can uh I don't yeah, there that. are external external indications that you have to acknowledge that you yourself are going to be biased and yeah muddled uh, so through your practice you can it's easier to see people's defilements so you'll see when people still have defilements that can be pretty clear but when people don't don't ex exhibit if, uh, unwholesome behavior it gets harder to actually be sure that they don't have the potential I mean, people outside of the buddha sasana can also exhibit very pure states of mind citta visuddhi is only the second purification because a pure mind is just a temple someone who practices some of them a certain thing and it's not not a uh, eternal thing at any time they could stop practicing and get very one thing to note about the forest idea here is it may be a bit of a a bit misleading the buddha says three three things the uh, forest jungle uh and secluded place or or remote area so any of those three and i think the inclusion of remote areas could be translated like that because it just means outside of uh, society and the point is that they are panta panta means pantancha uh, sayanasana so the actual physical forest is a bit it's not really saying that then a secluded place can be your room no yes. that's it to some extent i mean as far as your life goes it's going to be less about leave your room it's kind of not secluded anymore really still technically or ideally referring to something outside of the wasn't there a story about like a woman who could like read the buddha's footprint and tell that she uh this person has no greed i think they wanted to uh uh marry Their daughter to the Buddha. I think it was a couple. It was uh, Buddha said. There was an M. What was the no. name? No. Name I should. Was it Chinchimani? No. Magandhi, I think. Magandhi, yeah. Ah, yes, Magandhi. So, like, couldn't you use that as a reference, like, for someone who's worthy of praise? I don't think it's all that reliable. But the thing is, that's the Buddha. 
countless, uh, but uh, his body became very special. So the same for us. <laughs> yeah, Magandia, why we should know this name is because the daughter ended up becoming Samavati. <laughs> the other queen? killed herself. And the mother also named Magandia. Family name, I think. Bante, when we, when one is sitting, um, could the feeling that arises that we call sitting, could that ever be described, uh, could that ever be thought of as Vedana as well? No. So it's always, it's always has to be more of a, ple a pleasant, neutral or unpleasant feeling. It's not that it has to be, it's that that's what it is. Vedana is pleasant, painful, and neutral. What do you mean by has to be? Um, I, I was speaking unmindfully. Sorry, Bhante. Bhante, uh, what are the differences between the Kalesas and the Asavas? Well, we will learn at the end of the Sudhi Manga, so that's quite a ways away. Um, someone else recently asked me this, and I, I, I gave them the associated passage in the Visuddhi Manga, so um, I don't know if I can direct you to that, but it's in, oh, I can't, I can look it up here because I just looked it up. But the, the short answer is there's no difference, it's a different enumeration, um, but uh, if you have these kind of questions, you should look at chapter 22, paragraph 47. And on 2247. 47 isn't the page number, it's the paragraph number. The kinds of states that ought to be abandoned. Fetters, defilements, wrongnesses, worldly states, avarice, perversions, ties, bad ways, cankers, floods, bonds, hindrances, adherences, clingings, inherent, inherent tendencies, stains, unprofitable courses of action and unprofitable thought arisings. Those are, that's a pretty uh, exhaustive list of the various ways of talking about these things. One way of talking about them is the asava, another is the kilesa. So. I have a kind of technical question. It's like, um, like we could only know, we can never know an object itself, only like conscious experience. So like, does the, uh, like when you experience Nibbana, is that like just a conscious experience of Nibbana or is that like the actual Nibbana? Can I say again? Like, you know how we can only experience, we, the only thing we can know are experiences. So when, when you experience Nibbana, is that like the object, you're knowing the object, um, or is it like just the experience of Nibbana, but you can't know Nibbana so, or something? So nibbana is cessation, so there's no arising during that. That's why you can't note it. I have another Dhamma related question. In, when it says Sabe Dhamma Anatta, why is Nibbana considered uh, non, not self? You think it could, should be considered self? <laughs> if it's under your control, you should be able to attain Nibbana right now. Really. I remember reading that uh, somewhere that um, an Arahant has full control of the pathways of their mind. So, like, if they're an Arahant, wouldn't that, like, and they have full control of their mind? Like, wouldn't that kind of be the I don't way. know where you read that. It doesn't sound like the Buddha done that. If, if an Arahant has full control of the mind, Arahant should be able to uh, stop uh, experiences from arising at will instead of attaining Virodha Samapati. Yeah, I mean, it shows how ridiculous the idea of self is. Because if you had full control over your mind, you could prevent yourself from seeing even when your eyes are open you could you could even create seeing and or hearing or so on and it is it is clear that there is 
um, something that appears like control, but the illusion of control is an illusion. And underneath there is still a mechanical uh, process by which one sees and hears and smells and tastes and feels and thinks. I remember reading in uh, the Majjhima Nikaya 49, the Buddha was talking about um, a consciousness that's, you know, radiant, signless, boundless. Is that, is that like a jhana or I don't know what that's, was that like nibbana? Uh, radiant is maybe a bit misleading. Or I think is the idea. A radiant is in the metaphorical sense, or yeah, metaphorical sense, figurative. Mind can never be literally radiant because that radiance is a physical property. Uh, this passage referring to nibbana, or because I remember it said it does not partake in the allness of all. One day I was wondering about the bhavana, uh, wondering uh, what is the proper way to do bhavana. There are two kinds of bhavana, samatha bhavana and vipassana bhavana. Those are the two proper ways. Is it like, uh, is it like mindfully thinking or something like that? Have you read our booklet on how to meditate? Uh, I haven't. I haven't went through the full. I. Uh, I mean, I'm halfway through. Well, that's how you practice what we call vipassana bhavana. Samatha bhavana. There's forty different meditation topic subject. Well, concepts. Vipassana bhavana. Practice mindfulness. When the Satu asked in the chat and it also very interesting, I'm wondering where what is the quick link for the Visuddhi Magga? Shortcut in the digital body reader. You know that? No, I don't know. Because in the info where you can search for it, it says a lot of things, but can't find anything about the Visuddhi Maga. I thought you said quick, quick link. I think it could be helpful if you want to look up in Bali, I think. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I posted something um, about uh, like so-called pests, um, like cockroaches uh, in my, uh, there's some, there's cockroaches in my apartment. Um, you know, just wanting to, I did get some good, like, thoughts from, on that in the, in the Discord here, um, from some of the people here, um, like Delore and, um, and Sanka. So thank you guys. Um, I did just want to ask, ask, uh, ask you, uh, Bonte, if, if you don't mind, if I, uh, like explain my situation with these cockroaches in my apartment and like how I, how I might handle it. Uh, my property management uh, like has like a pest control person like, and uh, there's like a, like I said, there's cockroaches in my apartment and um, it, this person came around and put like a gel like um, cockroach bait in my apartment, and I, uh, I didn't. I, I was thinking like maybe I should like remove it, um, even though that's kind of like sabotaging like their efforts to like maintain their property or whatever. However, they want to justify it, but. Um, I don't know, but I also thought that like it's not really my place to to do that. But I don't know if that's 
if that's maybe just a cop out and I just I don't want I, I would rather just be rid of the, the cockroaches but anyway I kind of like let it go for for one night and uh, when I woke up in the morning there was like a bunch of like dying cockroaches on my kitchen floor and it just I don't know I, I didn't Kind of felt I kind of felt like I just kind of copped out and maybe I should um, remove the the tree the like the gel that they put like under my fridge and, um, to save the to save the cockroaches from eating it and dying. I don't know. I've I've had like mixed feelings and thoughts about it, but but yeah, I just don't know. If, if you, Bonte, or if anybody would care to give their thoughts on, on that. Well, the things that you do are never as important as your state of mind. Problem with asking questions about decision making. It's not, what's important is not what you decide to do, it's whether you decide to do something, it's about your state of mind when you do it. I mean, unless there's something clearly, some clear relationship, like if I do this, it'll be out of greed or anger, or delusion. Unless that's clear, you're never going to find this uh, uh, an answer. Should I do this? Should I not do this? And relying on that is 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 overlooking what's more important. It's um, sort of lack of of confidence. You have to stop looking for some divine answer to float down from the heavens. Do this, don't do that. You have to go by clarity of mind that comes from being mindful. Make your decisions because of that. The, the inability to decide comes from not paying attention to not paying proper attention to the mind states, it's things like guilt or worry or that sort of thing, allowing them to grow and to fester. Okay, what if I like the precept of not uh, stealing if he manipulates it, like wrapping it in plastic foil or just making it not function? And if the, the person comes back, can give it or show it to him and he didn't any damage to it but again you're missing you're, you're ignoring what i just said <laughs> no i, I don't think on, yeah. on what to do you just completely missed the point sorry what hinders dominate your mind regarding whether to do something or not is one awesome one awesome i would say yeah you have to be careful about definite answers to questions like that, like do this, don't do that, because you're, you're making assumptions and you're laying down law that doesn't actually exist. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. It's just some definite rules like that yeah. beyond the absolutes, like killing and stealing lying so so I, I didn't mean to jump all over suggestion I mean, it's a fine suggestion it's just not really the point making these kinds of suggestions is valuable giving people advice and pointing them in the right direction so it's fine it's, it's, the, the dangers in trying to make an assessment of some of a, a complex situation this really isn't our business to answer questions about what uh, someone should do in their specific situation. You have to investigate and make the right decisions, but that's only going to come through mindfulness. So the best advice one can give is cultivate mindfulness. And that's not all you have to do. You've got a complex situation that you have to deal with and you have to investigate and figure out what the consequences of your actions are going to be. But the advice that one can give you is 
to make sure you're incorporating mindfulness into that because you'll figure out the right thing to do. But as far as offering suggestions, I think that's valuable. People offer suggestions, tell stories like, well, in my situation, this happened to me and I did this. And that was a good, it had a good result or a bad result, that sort of thing. It can be helpful in pointing people in the right direction, but none of it's going to be very useful if the person isn't mindful. That all makes sense. Ponte, I have a question, and uh, it has to do with uh, one of the stories in the Dhammapada, which uh, I saw in a video of yours. Uh, and the story, to, to tell it very short, it was about a child who was dying and was visited by the Buddha. And uh, because of this visit, she ha the child had a very illuminated mind, a, a very elevated mind. And when the child died, they became an angel and came back as an angel and told the father uh, what happened. And uh, this story made me really think afterwards that uh, maybe th this would be true uh, even with uh, uh, the other religions, if uh, there is a component in the religion which causes the person to have uh, a better mind at the moment of their death, that would cause a better rebirth. For, so, for example, if someone accepts Jesus in their heart, that may give them an easier death in the sense that uh, they feel better about it. They don't feel sad or anything like that. They think that, oh, well, life has been tough, but now I'm gonna go in heaven. I can finally rest and I don't have to worry and I can be happy. And that uh, could maybe lead to a better rebirth where, where they actually get a heavenly rebirth. Like, like in the story, they become an angel. So I, I, I'm just, uh, thinking about this and uh, uh, maybe you can tell me if uh, I'm thinking in the right direction, is it uh, even uh, important what causes this state of mind? It seems like as long as this state of mind is there, a person would uh, benefit from it. Yeah, I just don't like the language accepts Jesus into their heart. Um, the, the, the problem with that is it's it's not really uh, integral, but you're certainly onto something. There's even a meditation called Dewa Nusati, one of the 40 meditation subjects, and it's um, recollection of the Devas and the qualities that they have, the angels, the gods. So the qualities of Jesus and thinking of him as God and that sort of thing ha has value to it, even in Buddhism. But um, the, see, the accepting Jesus into into one's heart involves views about the nature of God and the nature of reality that are wrong views, and so that's going to be harmful. But quite likely, many Christians do go to heaven because there's a lot of heavenly principles see, involved in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Nothing remarkable about that in, from a Buddhist perspective, because heaven isn't the goal. I mean, heaven isn't permanent or eternal the way they think it is. But um, it's valuable because Jesus had a lot of valuable teachings, uh, teachings about turning the other cheek, about uh, be, being meek and that sort of thing, and um, being kind and being letting go of the world and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's not everything. He, some, some of the things he taught are objectionable and problematic, but of all the theistic religions, Christianity is probably the uh, most innocent and, and that I can think of, well, that I know of anyway, because uh, there is some value to what he taught, some of the things he taught. But the the core theories about accepting Jesus into one's heart, those are not it, those are problematic. Did you say theistic religion, Spante? Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, I owe it to you because uh, my mind was open to these things 
in the sense that uh, earlier I would just uh, dismiss Christianity. I would think that uh, no, they, they're not on to anything at all. But like you said, it's uh, not perfect, but that there are some good things. And I think uh, it's better to have those good things than nothing at all. Of course, uh, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, it, it seems like uh, we have more tools at our disposal. We have more knowledge and uh, we can take it even further. But I, I'm no longer looking at Christians and being dismissive of them. It seems like they are actually doing uh, something that is good. Yeah, there's uh, the, the interesting thing is um, Christianity thereby is, is very strong. Uh, Christian faith is very strong and very powerful and can be very intimidating because of how, how confident and at peace they are because there is some there is strength and that's the kind of thing that leads you to heaven but the funny thing is it conversely makes it very hard to teach christians how to meditate because they're already happy they're they're confident they're on the upswing and they're going to a good place so why would they be interested in practicing buddhism furthermore i mean more importantly is their views are very strong views about what is right and i'm saved because i believe in jesus end of story end of argument they don't need logic they don't need reason they don't need fact all they need is their belief and it it works for them and it probably will not the belief but the strength of mind will probably will send many of them to heaven christians can be really awesome like really uh, nice and kind and helpful and friendly sometimes sickeningly so with their views but the views are the sickness and that's the problem is teaching the meditation can be very challenging. They, they're very much more inclined away from it. Whereas look at Jewish people, how interested Jewish people are in Buddhism and their religion is kind of awful in many ways. I mean, not the day to day, but the, the, the views and the teachings in the Torah are far more objectionable. Yeah, I actually, so, sorry. To but 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 Jewish people are very happy to, and I think it's because there's a real lack of views in Judaism. There is some views, but they're not very strong. What what is what does it mean to be a Jewish? I mean, you just have to be born Jewish. Do you have to believe something? Do you have to believe in you have to believe in God? You don't even have to believe in God on to be Jewish. And if you do, you don't have to agree with him. You don't have to worship him. You can. Uh, you kind of thank him and praise him for the most part, but there's not a lot of clinging to views. I think it's an important part. I actually met the Jew who came to meditate at my temple. I had no idea uh, why he was into it, but it seemed like he was much, well, he was very open to like all kinds of things. He was trying Buddhism and uh, other types of meditation, but uh, you, you said that it's hard to get Christians to meditate. And th this is also a topic that I was thinking of, because uh, when, when Christians are praying, that is, uh, I'm not going to say that that is meditation, but that is very close to meditation. And I, I was thinking that uh, I could tell them that uh, there, there is a technique that you can do. And uh, they, the technique goes like this. You go to the church when it's silent or, or you do this at home when it's silent. And uh, you say your prayer as uh, you have your hands clasped and uh, your eyes are closed. And after that prayer, you don't move on. You just sit in silence for some time. And uh, this could be very close to m meditation. That's what I was thinking and they could even find it acceptable. I haven't uh, tried uh, telling them, uh, look, you could do this and get some extra clarity on this fr from this practice. But uh, m maybe I'll suggest it to them and uh, m maybe it will even help them. Uh, what is your opinion on this method? I, I think you're on the, on the right track. That sounds like something I think could be valuable. Um, I don't know if you've read our booklet, but sitting silently isn't really quite enough. But that's not a real criticism. It's, you got the right idea there. I think it potentially is beneficial. 
Um, something further, I think, that is a way of reaching out to such people is um, directing their attention to their defilements because they're not going to be free from them, but they're going to want to be. And they're going to not want to be angry people and they're, not go gonna, they're gonna not want to be greedy people, but they can't help themselves like everyone. So helping them notice that um, it, it's not really enough. Even their faith isn't unshakable. And if you want unshakable faith, you need something stronger, stronger than God, in fact. Maybe don't say that to them first off. Well, well uh, I would try to put it uh, in, in terms that they are, can understand. So, yeah, uh, in, in I, I guess I, I guess I wouldn't I would suggest don't spend too much energy on it, because if they can't understand, if you have to, if you have to bend to the point of breaking where you're actually affirming prayer to God and that sort of thing, you might be reaching too far afield. Sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, I was thinking that in Christianity, they, they actually have some kind of state that is um, in their mind, it should be free of defilements. So that, that is having uh, the Holy Spirit in you. So when you are in that state, you should not be able to have uh, uh, like what we would call defilements. You would not be uh, angry or you would not do bad deeds, things like that. And uh, when you think about it, uh, the way that uh, Jesus baptized was with uh, not not with water, but with Holy Spirit. And uh, you could look at um, uh, Christians and uh, see whether they they just did it for the ritual. The, the ritual would just be where uh, a monk uh, throws like a bucket of water on your head, and then you, they say that now you are a Christian. But uh, that, that doesn't seem like sufficient. That that's that's just the ritual part of it. But uh, the actual part that does help you, or or, or would help the Christians, if uh, they adopted the Holy Spirit during this procedure, and they stopped uh, doing bad deeds, having uh, bad thoughts, they would be as free from defilements as possible, right? And uh, if they can get to that state, then they would be true Christians. That's what I would say, because uh, if you just uh, sprinkle them with water, that, that that's not changing their minds at all. And, and uh, maybe if uh, you, yeah, but what does this have to do with Buddhist practice? That this has nothing to do. Yeah. But what value that, is it? Yeah, the, I think uh, the value it would is that it would help them a little bit, but. Uh, like in Buddhist practice, we have uh, better tools, I would say. Um, well, yeah, I don't think it's even just better tools. It's right, the right, right tools, tools versus whatever the opposite of tools is. Um, but if you take the Holy Spirit into you, you're, you're on the wrong path. You're, just, you're cultivating wrong views and it's unwholesome. Never really be a source of certainty or strength even though it, it, it can be conventionally strong there's a, there's a conditional strength but it's it's, it's weak it's relatively weak and uh, harmful not just weak but harmful it's what leads uh, i mean it's what leads to holy wars even people are so devout in their their religions that they go to war with other religions I mean, it's not because of their devotion, it's because of the wrongness, the perversion. And you can see how it's very strong. It's why religion leads to war is because religion is very strong and it compels you or propels you towards war. You look at the situation in Israel, a lot of it's just because of religion. You could say it's politics or power and greed or whatever, but religion doesn't, their religions don't don't to free them from those things. And so of course it's mixed with greed and, and, and uh, ideology like politics and that sort of thing. Because the religion allows for that and even supports it. Like you read the Torah and 
you read the Quran, there's so much about war and killing and encouraging it. You know, and God helps you kill your enemies. Well, well you're right. Uh, I guess those were my final thoughts. Thank you, Bhante. In the Quran and the, the Torah, they, they, they show, they, they encourage, or they have teachings about killing and war. Uh, and even the Vedas, it was the last thing I said, in the Vedas, uh, the, the base of it is, uh, may Indra give me power and or my enemies and allow me to defeat the demons, the dark-skinned demons. They were these light-skinned Aryans fighting against the dark-skinned Indians. Anyway, the, uh, this is, religion allows for this, um, or if the religion allows for this, then the strength that you get can be very dangerous. And that's why wrong view and right view is so integral, much more than, much more integral or important than whether a person has a strong mind or even a pure mind. Because a pure mind is temporary and can be used, the power of that can be used for nefarious purposes, given that there are impure minds as well. Pure minds, pure minds are not the goal. A pure mind is a valuable tool, but it can also be a dangerous tool if you have wrong view. And wrong view is the real um, target. The real goal is not your mind, it's right view. Which is why the Visuddhi Manga is laid out the way it is. It's quite curious. It's a surprise to hear that Jitta Visuddhi, purification of mind, is only two. It's only number two out of seven steps. Seven steps. So there's five more after purification of mind. Because mind is just a moment. Again, those powerful minds can be used for any unwholesome purposes. When we speak of right view, do we do we mean also like the Four Noble Truths? Yes. Is that, I, I guess, going back to my earlier question, that's why when we speak of the Third Noble Truth, the cessation, that's something that is, I guess, also so strong and, and permanent because it it lasts or follows us well, until, well, it has no limit, right? Right. Thank you, Bhante. <clears throat> then previously, when you were talking about the seven tools, were you referring to the Anapanasati Sutta? No, it's in the Ratan Vinita Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 24. Thank you. So on the opposite then, uh, in Jainism, for example, it's, it seems to be very uh, peaceful, or not peaceful, but um, harmless, but there has to be a lot of aversion, right? Because they, if they see others doing that, or they have aversion towards killing, for example, not killing, like trying not to harm anything, because it's such an extreme, it's, I, don't, I can't imagine it can lead to any peaceful state. Well, there's yeah. some good basis there. I mean, Zionism is good in certain ways because of, well, the, obviously the harm, harmlessness, but also they don't uh, they don't cling to views of God or that sort of thing. Zionism is just the teaching of a misguided teacher. They have wrong views and wrong ideas about freedom. So I was I was going to ask Bante, uh, what do you mean about uh, so do you mean uh, what you say about religious people that they have these strong minds? Uh, these strong minds are about goodness, right? It's it's not involved with um, with the view. Right. It would be uh, probably jnana vipayu. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Without uh, knowing about the consequence that there is consequences of their action, but firmly be believing. Sorry. Without wisdom, yeah. It would be wholesome minds without wisdom. 
it's maybe it not be. even fair to go that far because it could be with with jnana with knowledge because of knowledge of the, the, the goodness of their deeds but not always you know there's going to be doing it because god says it's right that sort of thing which is obviously yeah. jnana we believe mm -hmm. i was thinking the same so it's about like just helping other people and they are really really big on that right helping other people yeah. and they enjoy enjoy helping and I'd say practically many times they do understand, yeah, it's because it's um, because of the wholesomeness of it, because of the quality of mind and what it does to you. But it's it's muddled and it's going to be uh, broken. And so many times it'll be without without wisdom when they just do it because God wants them to, that sort of thing, or it makes them it's it, you could say similar to how um buddhists might do it to go to heaven it's probably well uh, maybe that's pushing it it's just going to be mixed there's going to be with wisdom and without wisdom is, is that wrong um to think of cessation as something permanent i guess now that we're speaking of um kind of Buddhists going to heaven and just our our difference in views and stuff. I've never I've never talked about any of this with with you, about it, or with anybody. For that matter. I don't understand the question. Um, sorry. Is it is it wrong to think of cessation as something permanent? Like like an ever or a permanent shift? I think is more the term uh well cessation is an event but the shift that happens because of experiencing that is lasting thank you Bante. Bante, i have a question about mindfulness and its connection to memory like in uh, devanusati it's like called the recollection of the devas. So like, but when we use it for mindful, like in other contexts, Sati, it means mindfulness. Like why is there a difference? That never really means mindfulness. That's not an accurate translation. It means remembrance or the ability to remember kind of thing. Uh, so in Satipatthana, it means present moment, ability to recollect or re remember the present moment. Remember, see, because we forget, it can be described as forgetting when you're living in the past or the future, or even in conceptual reality, you've forgotten in the sense that you are not um, cognizant or aware of the present you're not focused on reality so you've forgotten reality in favor of concepts or memories or imagination about the future um there's also like a part in like a few suttas where it says uh, like as a part of sati that you remember what was said long ago is this like an active part of right mindfulness or is this like a result of practice uh, it's yeah a result it's the, the the mind's ability to the sharpness or the clarity of mind and i had a question also um you speak of i remember you saying something about in the four noble truths in one of your videos that there's three things that you have to do about each noble truth um but i forget the terms that you use i was just wondering if you could speak on that there is one thing to be done about each of the noble truths would that be to uh, abandon them no it's different for each of the four uh, you well, want to abandon the cessation of suffering right you want to abandon that one about which one which one do you want to abandon 
The second one? What do you want to do about the first one? See it clearly? Understand it fully. You're not wrong, but the actual answer is understand completely. And the fourth one? Focus on right mindfulness and develop the rest of it. That's, that's not a good answer. Yeah, develop. There you got it. Huh? That's actually exact. Good answer. See? Luis knows his stuff. Don't, don't still questions. And still has questions. Well, that's a bad sign. People still have questions. It's a bad sign. But... Knows the answer, still have questions. What's, oh. the, what's the problem? I'm still developing the fourth noble truth. What about the third one? Do I do I have to? Fully realize. Realize. See it for yourself. I'm working on it, Mr. Students. Right, I should go. Have a good week, everyone. Sound. Thank you so much, Pante. Sadu, 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 sadu.